Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, so for, today, for today's event, uh, Sally and I will be discussing uh, this creative nonfiction anthology titled Hadab uh, Baladuna, uh, uh, Arab American Narratives of Boundary and Belonging. And this was uh, recently published in uh, June uh, 2022 and co-edited uh, by Sally Howell, uh, Nabil Abraham, and myself. Um, so Sally and I both teach at the University of Michigan Dearborn. Uh, Nabil Abraham um, taught for, he's a retired professor, he taught for several years at Henry Ford uh, Community College in, in Dearborn, Michigan. Um, so Hada Baladana, which translates from Arabic into English as this is our country or this is our homeland, aims to provide an intimate glimpse into the Arab American communities in the Detroit metropolitan area. Um, essays and poems by established and emerging writers from the region address a broad range of topics, including notions of identity, citizenship, religion, gender politics, family life, immigration, and exile, as well as the impact of the war on terror, the refugee crisis, Islamophobia, and recent immigration restrictions on everyday life. So what we thought we'd do is we'll first um, talk about how the book came about, and then we'll discuss uh, the contents of the book, and uh, we'll touch on each essay and poem in the book, and in some cases we'll read excerpts uh, from the pieces. We, can't, we don't have enough time to read excerpts from every single work, uh, but we hope to give um, our audience just kind of a, a taste of the book, a glimpse into uh, the different narratives in this anthology. Uh, Hada Baladuna is the third installment in the Arab Detroit series. It follows Arab Detroit from Margin to Mainstream, which was published in 2000, and Arab Detroit 9-11, Life in the Terror Decade, which came out in 2011. These earlier books mix scholarly essays with works of memoir, poetry, photography, and interviews. This new book differs from its predecessors in that it's um, um, entirely composed of creative works, mostly created around fiction essays as well as uh, poetry, and actually um, a set of photographs, which you can see behind us, um, by the Lebanese and Palestinian American photographer, Rani Matar. Sally, did you want to say anything about, because you worked on the previous two books, was there anything you wanted to say more about um, the Arab Detroit how, series? Yeah, how, yeah so we, we went to Wayne State University Press um, uh, Nabil Abraham and Andrew Shryock and I, we were the co-editors of the last book in the series, and Andrew and Nabil um, edited the first one. And so we wanted to do a book sort of in response to um, what was happening in Dearborn during the Trump years, uh, uh, um, you know, with, with Trump's Islamophobia and xenophobia uh, and um, his, uh, the travel ban, the Muslim travel ban that he instituted right after he got in office. There was a lot of pressure on the Arab community at that time. And so we were working on a collection and we went to talk to one of the editors at Wayne State University Press, which published the series. And, uh, and the editor we spoke with was like, well, you, you know, we see what, what sells of these, you know, because people now can download just one chapter at a time. And, uh, and she was really excited to have us do a new volume, but she also really thought it was worth our breaking out the creative nonfiction essays from the academic writing. And as someone who teaches uh, uh, in Dearborn, and I use these books to teach, I find that I myself very often use the creative nonfiction essays <laughs> more than the academic essays. I can kind of give a lecture on the essay or I can assign it, but these creative nonfiction essays, the students really respond to them. So I, you know, I thought that was a great idea. I jumped on that opportunity. And, uh, and yeah, and, and I had a new young colleague who had just joined our faculty, Hassan, who was teaching creative writing on our campus. And so I knew that we had an opportunity to, to, um, to, to really do something new with this book. And Nabil has contributed to the earlier books. He wrote, quite, he wrote several of the most moving of the creative nonfiction pieces that we had in the earlier books. So we really, you know, so Nabil and, and Hassan and I were working on this book. And then we have another team working on the academic book. Which, uh, which is also in the works. So, um, but I also just want to, we, we forgot to thank the Library of Michigan, <laughs> which yes. is supporting this writing tour, the Michigan Notable Book Tour. So we yeah. thank them too for, for, for hosting this series. Um, yeah, so, and, uh, um, and we actually put out, so we, uh, yeah, um, we put out we a call. We put out a call for submissions um, in around um, 
end of 2018, early 2019. Mm -hmm. um, we also solicited, solicited um, essays and um, from works people of poetry we knew. From, yeah. from, from writers from the Detroit metropolitan area. And um, so we started working with the contributors and then COVID hit. And so um, for several years, uh, we were in communication with the contributors via email, changing, uh, they would send us their essays. Um, we would read them and we'd go back and forth offering feedback. And um, so when the book came out in June 2022, we actually had um, a launch party at the, uh, at the library uh, at the University of Michigan Dearborn. And um, it was actually the first time that we all um, got together as a group. And uh, I know Sally knows some of the contributors um, from before, but for me personally, it was the first time I saw many of the contributors for the first time in person. So that was also kind of a unique experience. Um, yeah. There, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, that's, that's, and just we also like to point out that several of the contributors are students or former students yeah. of ours. So I think that also makes the book especially meaningful mm -hmm. to us. So, Do you want to start with an introduction? well, so yeah, I was just going to read a quick opening passage from the book because I think it does uh, provide a little bit of a, a context and a, maybe a bit of an introduction to who is in the volume. So, um, this is how the book starts um, The voices of Arab Detroit are many. They connect us to homelands throughout the Middle East, from Lebanon and Syria to Yemen and Iraq. They are also rooted in the industrial heartland of the United States and in the history of Detroit itself, which has always been a borderland of one type or another, between lake and shore, French and English, fugitive and free. While Arabs don't really enter Detroit's story until the 1890s, they have been a part of all the things that made the city prominent in the 20th century and those that ripped it apart the phoenix-like life cycle of the auto industry, the cauldron of overlapping migrations and diasporas, the cultural efflorescence of Motown and the concert of colors, the entrepreneurialism of everything from food to vice, political struggles for a living wage, fair housing, racial equity, clean air and water, religious freedom, and a free Palestine, and the restless movement of industry and people from city to suburb to exurb to city again. For well over a century, Detroit has been a refuge for Arab migrants and a jumping off point for their American dreams. And the contributors to this volume are eager to claim this place and history for themselves. We have titled this collection, Hatha Baladna, This is our home, our homeland, to reflect the sentiment of belonging that gives these narratives cohesion, at once a birthright and a matter of choice, a place of endearment and of restraint. Arab Detroit is the unambiguous home, homeland of the voices gathered here. Thank you. And, and, and speaking of home, uh, uh, my essay titled An Atlas of Homes uh, opens uh, the anthology. And so I thought I'd read a very short excerpt from that, um, from that essay and just to kind of preface it. Um, so I, I, I moved, to, my wife and I moved to Dearborn, Michigan in fall of 2018 um, for, for a job. Uh, up until that point, I hadn't ever um, uh, been to uh, Dearborn, Michigan. Although I had heard, you know, I had actually heard about it uh, several years before, um, as um, my family, and I, my family and I uh, at the time were living in uh, the D.C. area, and we would always order um, sweets such as batlawa from this famous sweet shop in Dearborn called Chitilas. Um, so Dearborn was always kind of in our consciousness, and then in graduate school, I started to research about the, the city, the area, the Arab American community in the area. And so for all those years before visiting the city, I, I had actually mythologized it. So I was super excited to actually uh, finally move to the city. And I should just say that my, um, I also spent a lot of time in, in Beirut, Lebanon, and my wife is from um, Beirut. So when she immigrated to the US, uh, she actually came to Dearborn. Um, so when I say we, it's my wife and I. We drove north up I-75 from Ohio and arrived in Dearborn in the early evening. After checking in at a motel, we drove to the east side of town, which was predominantly Arab. We were eager to see the Dearborn I had mythologized for the past several years. Our first stop was the Shatila Bakery, which I typed into Google Maps. On our way, to the bakery, we found an Arabic station on the radio. The DJ only spoke in Arabic and played Arabic songs. And as the voice of Maham Zain, a singer from Baalbek, soared through our speakers, we drove down Michigan Avenue, past the Arab American National Museum, 
and took a left on Schaefer Road. Grocery stores and restaurants on either side of the road bore signs in Arabic and English. We took a left on Warren Avenue and arrived at Shatida's on the corner of Schaefer and Williamson. The bakery was packed with Middle Easterners, the majority of the women wearing headscarves. Artificial palm trees decorated with string lights arched over the patrons sitting at the tables. Behind a glass counter were tempting cakes and pastries that we usually found in the patisseries in Beirut. Around the, around the counter was a display of Arabic cookies, batlawa, and trays of kenafi. Rana and I bought kenafi in a pot of Turkish coffee flavored with cardamom and sat under a palm tree. A mix of Arabic and English buzzed in the air. It feels like we're in Beirut, Rana said. And I'll end there. Um, and the next essay um, is titled Watan by Hanan Nasser. And um, Sally mentioned uh, just a bit earlier that um, um, some of our former students, um, are, uh, some of their work is actually featured in the book, and, and Hanan is one of them. Um, and she, um, she um, um, in her essay Watan, she details um, her family's um, really compelling um, migration story from Iraq to uh, the Detroit metropolitan area. Um, she and her family left in 1997 to escape uh, the regime of Saddam Hussein. Um, and, you know, Hanan's piece, what's really interesting about it, when I had her in class in the fall of 2018, um, she was a, kind of a quiet and shy student, but on the page, her voice really um, soared, and, and she really found her voice on the page. And the way that she has framed her essay is as a letter to her younger sister. And so I thought I'd read the opening page um, from her essay. Dear Noor, I remember little of myself at your age. I recall being a child, sensitive, not unlike yourself, but silly and unfledged and too shy. I believe that my consciousness began the day you were born. I remember thinking as I watched your wrapped newborn body, now I am finally awake. From now on, I'll remember. It was then I felt I had finally grown into consciousness, finally able to fully remember what I had seen and felt. With your birth, I began knowing and remembering, and with your growth, I met a glimpse of my once lost childhood self. As you may know now, our parents have not always lived here. I, too, was not born here. In 1997, when I was three years old, our family fled Baghdad following the Iraqi Civil War, which was a series of uprisings, uprisings during the Persian Gulf War. It was a turbulent and violent time that made life very dangerous for our Iraqis. We traveled to Jordan, where we waited for 18 months before being granted permission to enter the United States. I do not remember much of these transition years, nor much of those following our settling into America. I did not find it difficult to imagine, however, how our parents must have felt during these early years. I later witnessed these emotions when finding photographs taken of them as they walked through the aisles of the Detroit Metropolitan Airport for the first time. In the photographs, Mama and Baba stood tall and smiling, our brother, sister, and I below them, seemingly unaware of our surroundings. Um, and so, um, um, from there, as, as, as we mentioned earlier, um, the book also includes um, poetry. And the next poem is by um, the, um, the Iraqi poet Dunya Michel, and it's titled Baghdad in Detroit. And um, this poem was actually published in um, uh, Dunya's most recent poetry collection, In Her Feminine Sign. And uh, Dunya is um, a, a remarkable poet, nonfiction writer, and fiction writer. Uh, she's very well established, not just uh, locally, but nationally. Um, and her background is in journalism. And um, her most recent novel is titled The Bird Tattoo. Uh, and what's really interesting, um, and I conducted an interview with her um, um, about a year or two ago. And she mentioned how, um, so she left uh, Baghdad um, um, in the 90s. And she didn't return until about 20 years later, in 2016, uh, to conduct research for a creative nonfiction book that she was writing. And she had been born and raised in Baghdad, and it was her beloved city. She had so, memory, so many memories of the city. And so when I asked her, well, what was it like returning to the city? Um, 
she said, I actually didn't return. I went back to Halak, but I never returned to Baghdad. And when I asked her why, she explained that um, for all those years um, being apart from the city, she had retained all her memories of Baghdad. And she didn't want the, the reality of Baghdad um, to kind of tarnish the images that she had retained over time. Um, and her poem is titled Baghdad in Detroit. On the 4th of July, here in Detroit, I hear the echo of Baghdad explosions. They say it is the sound of fireworks. Song by song, I scatter my birds away from the fog of smoke. They say it is ordinary clouds in the sky. A butterfly from the Tigris shore alights on my hand. No bombs today to scare her away. They say this is the Detroit River. I enter a shelter with the others in the crowd. We will leave at the end of the raid. They say this is the tunnel to Canada. And I'll um, pass it over to Sally. Um, yes, yeah, so the next, um, the next essay is by um, a, a, a school teacher in Dearborn. Her name is Yasmin Mohammed. Um, she also contributed an essay to one of the earlier books. And her essay is a very moving essay about what it was like for her to grow up in a very traditional conservative Yemeni household um, in the south end of Dearborn, a sort of isolated neighborhood from the rest of the city, um, at a time when the Yemeni community was still relatively new and growing. And um, so she you know, talks about the pressures that her family put on her to get married right out of school. They didn't really value her education necessarily. Um, but she did. She valued her education. So it's really a narrative about her struggle to, to succeed outside the home. And it's a beautiful essay. It's, it's not one that, so the, the essays that we're not reading from, <laughs> it's, not a, it's not because they're not wonderful essays. It's just because it's harder to find sort of a short text that really mm -hmm. conveys the, the ideas of the author. Um, but yet she writes also about her family struggle with, um, like her father had schizophrenia and how that affected her community. So it's a beautiful essay, and I encourage people who are getting the book to read it. Um, it's beautiful, and written with just, um, just a real kind of honesty. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's wonderful. Um, the next essay that um, I'm, I'm going to read from is by um, a teacher in the Dearborn schools. He now teaches at Henry Ford Early College, um, who is a, a young Lebanese Iraqi immigrant um, who dramatizes how his love for hip hop specifically Tupac, led him to writing poetry and also his embracing his identity as an Arab American and a Muslim American, and it's a really lively piece. So uh, let me go there. Um, so for some reason, I haven't marked this 80, one. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Mark. But which, which paragraph? 85. Um, I think right towards the bottom in time, the very okay, bottom. Okay, 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 yeah. mm -hmm. sorry. Um, in time, music became more than social currency. I listened to Britney Spears and the Backbeat Boys to survive the poet pressure of middle school, the peer pressure of middle school. But Jay-Z, Eminem, and DMX made me feel alive. This was the most haram music of all, gangster rap. It was profane, sexual, and violent, but it revved my soul and gave voice to my rage against the duplicitous world around me. It was real, raw, Abe and proud. It shunned the rules and defied social norms. It was hostile, but most of all, rap was individualistic. It asserted the rapper's right to be who he is. It defied establishments in the name of individual expression and did so with unapologetic courage. It was the most precise expression of my personal hostility against the cultural conformity of my environment. I had to devise all sorts of schemes to gain access to gangster rap. Since it was rarely played on the radio due to its explicit content, I could only listen to it on CD. Up until that time, I had always honored my parents' directive that music CDs, cassettes, and instruments were not allowed in the house. But technically, if I happened to be over at a friend's house and he happened to own a large rap CD collection, then I wasn't exactly breaking their rules. So I'd visit my friends, and we would listen to DMX, Eminem, Jay-Z, Snoop Dogg, and Dr. Dre. I committed many of the songs to memory and would rap them to myself when I was alone. Eventually, I started to compose my own rap lyrics in my head to match the beats of my favorite songs. 
And in the course of that process, without realizing what was happening, I underwent some serious changes. So this is about his development from a, you know, a religiously conservative household to being a, a really creative poet in his right. adult life. It's a, it's a great essay yeah. filled with humor. Yeah, and speaking of humor, what's really, um, it also speaks to the, the, the book as a whole in the sense that, um, like we said, we have a diverse range of voices um, from different Arab ethnicities, but also a diverse range of tones. So this was very comedic and playful. We have others that are comedic and tragic, and some that are more, more dramatic in nature. So it's, it's a, a wide range of different kinds of styles. Um, so following um, uh, Yusuf al qamusis essay, there is um, an experimental poem um, by a very interesting poet uh, named Yasmin Nukia. I actually won't um, uh, read the poem aloud, but I did want to read the title to kind of give you an uh, um, insight into kind of like the colorful nature of her poetry. Alphabet soup at the Lebanese-Syrian border. I bought my bowl from the Kitchen Warehouse Plus on Warren across from Shatida. I also encourage you to read this poem. Um, and um, following the poem uh, is an essay titled On the Margins, Queer Arab American by May Jakubowski. And um, May Jakubowski details their experience growing up with an Arab father and uh, a non-Arab mother and how they were torn between their Arab and American identity. Uh, and the essay also details um, the author's queer identity and the challenges uh, coming out to their father, um, who wasn't very accepting of their sexual orientation. So um, it just deals with a lot of um, compelling themes in interesting ways about um, their sexual orientation, uh, identity, uh, growing up in Dearborn. Um, and and do, you, do you want to talk about Jeff Kudu's essay? Because that also deals with um, an Arab American identity and having one parent. Yeah, yeah. Jeff. Um, uh, yeah, Jeff Karub is the grandson of one of the first imams who came to Detroit. He came into the U.S. in 1912. Um, the family legend is that he was crossing the Atlantic at the sa on the same night that the Titanic was uh, was crossing the Atlantic, and that his ship received the call. So, um, but his his uh, his grandfather started a mosque. It was the first mosque that actually was built as a mosque in the United States in Highland Park that opened mm -hmm. in. 1921, um, and his, his grandfather was a very important person in the community. Uh, Jeff's father, uh, Jeff had an uncle who became an imam like his father and, and led a congregation in Dearborn for many years, but Jeff's father was a bit of a rebel. He became a musician, and he played for the Detroit Symphony. He, um, he also played for Motown. He was one of the studio artists of Motown, and he's on many of the, the very famous, iconic Motown albums. Um, he also taught uh, music in Livonia. So that's the kind of household Jeff was raised in, despite his family's religious heritage. His mother was um, a non-Arab. And Jeff became a journalist. He's also a musician, a very accomplished musician. But he um, now he works for the U of M in the uh, media office. He does reporting from the campus. Um, but he, when we asked him to write a story, um, we asked him to contribute to an earlier book, but he was not allowed to because at the time he worked for AP, and they wouldn't let him contribute a story for a book because he used some of the authors of the book as his sources. So <laughs> it was complicated. But anyway, so he, wrote a he writes a really beautiful essay about what it's like for him. He eventually moved back to Dearborn. And so he lives in Dearborn. He'd never lived there before, but he moved there with his family. And he's raising his daughters in Dearborn. And, you know, kind of just, you know, he's from one of the earliest Arab immigrant families to the area. Mm -hmm. But he's, he has very little in common, really, with so many of these immigrants who are coming right now from the Middle East, you know. Um, and so he, he, this is really a reflection on his part about what it means to be Arab. And he's titled his essay, Not Arab Enough. Um, and it's a really beautiful essay because he also deals with, you know, like watching his daughters um, be comfortable and at home and assimilate in this Arab community, this really big, diverse Arab community that they live in. You know, and so he's sort of, he's like, well, maybe I am Arab enough mm -hmm. after all. You know, like he's seeing that the, 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 the culture is one that embraces and welcomes people. So right. it's, it's a nice essay. It really is. And just to kind of change um, uh, the genres, we'll go into photography. And um, so we included, uh, there's an interview 
um, with Rania Matar, the Lebanese Palestinian American uh, photographer. So she was actually born um, and raised in Beirut, Lebanon, and she came to the States for uh, for university, and she stayed uh, she stayed in the States. Um, and now she's a very accomplished poet, uh, accomplished photographer uh, uh, um, uh, here nationally uh, and abroad. And so she came, she came to Dearborn in uh, spring of 2019 um, to take photographs of Arab American women. A lot of her work focuses on mothers, uh, on, on mothers and their relationships with their daughters, and capturing that experience uh, in uh, photography. But she also deals with. Um, young, um, young Arab, uh, young Arab and Arab American woman. So, she, uh, her intention in coming to Dearborn uh, and the Detroit metropolitan area was to try to capture photographs of um, Arab American women. So, what I thought I'd do is I w I'll actually leave this stage for a moment just to kind of go to the podium and scroll down some, uh, scroll down um, the slides here, and just kind of give you an example of what's uh, of, of her work. So, there are about five photographs that are included um, in her book. And I'll go to the first one. So this is titled Zarabuta, Detroit, Michigan, 2019. And most of the photographs she ended up taking were um, in Detroit. Okay. Um, this one is titled um, uh, Zarguta, Detroit, Michigan, also 2019. What's really interesting about this photograph is that um, the, 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 um, the two young women are actually sisters. Uh, and for Rania Matar, um, I remember she was kind of just discussing this photograph. What really compelled her to take it was to kind of show the diverse range of the Arab American experience, particularly, particularly when it comes to Arab American women, um, that you know one can wear the hijab, the headscarf, and one um, may choose not to wear it, um, that there's no monolithic representation or image of what it means to be Arab, Muslim, or an Arab American woman. This is, uh, did you want to say something about Rebecca's photograph? Um, I don't need to. Yeah, okay. And this is uh, titled Rebecca, Detroit, Michigan, 2019. And this photograph was taken on the spur of the moment. Um, Rebecca, she's a subject, she was, um, actually her face was turned to the camera and then all of a sudden she turned her face and then I took the picture. And uh, Rebecca actually ended up really liking this photograph. <laughs> so this is titled uh, Fatima, Detroit, Michigan, 2019. And Fatima is actually a former student of uh, Sally and I. And this is titled Amal, Fort Wayne, Detroit, Michigan, 2019. What I thought I'd do is um, I'll read um, just a few short excerpts from um, an interview that, that is published um, in, in the book with Rania Matar, um, just to kind of give you an insight into her process. And I asked her the following question. Um, Tell me about your first impressions of the Detroit metro area. And Rania said, Dearborn first felt very different from Detroit. I was agreeably surprised when I walked into the stores and people just greeted me in Arabic. It was like being in Lebanon. Detroit has a very different feel. What I loved about Detroit was the texture of the place. And in the work She, uh, She is a, a, is a book that Rania published uh, previously, I'm very interested in texture and ta uh, tactility, the sense of the surrounding and how it becomes part of the backdrop of the photograph. I love Detroit for that. So most of the images in this book are actually from Detroit. And then I asked her, did working in the Arab community in the Detroit metro area pose any particular challenge, challenges for you? And she said, not at all, actually. I work with young women who enjoy being part of the process. I first try to make the work feel very collaborative. I want them to feel empowered by the process, to have a say in it, to feel beautiful. If you pay the right amount of attention to people when you're of, of photographing them, you really can get beautiful and intimate images because people are beautiful. You just have to create the right level of comfort, trust, and collaboration. Um, and then from Rania, Rania's uh, set of photographs, we go to um, uh, 
Uh, another poet named Hayan Sharara, and, and, and Sally, I'll give you the floor. Uh, yeah, Hayan um, is a poet who grew up in Detroit um, on the border of Dearborn. His mom was a school teacher in Dearborn, and his, ran his dad worked at a, a grocery store. Um, they were immigrants from Lebanon, and uh, Hayan is uh, he's a very important figure in Arab American literature. He's one of the founders of Rawi, the um, the, the Arab American Writers Association, and he's he teaches now in Texas. Um, he teaches in a creative writing program, and he's just one of sort of the. Um, I, he's become one of the senior figures. I still think of him as a young man, but he's become sort of one of the senior voices of Arab American poetry, really someone who encourages other writers. And uh, But anyway, having grown up in Detroit and Dearborn, these places figure heavily in his work. And uh, uh, so he has one essay in here called Thinking Detroit, which is really about, um, it's about memory and the, the way that memory, you know, memories of place, places that you've left, stay with you and shape who you are and how you can revisit those places, sort of what you were saying mm -hmm. about Dunya and Baghdad, you know, that she wants to keep the mm -hmm. Baghdad of her youth in her mind. Um, but Hayan does, does come back to visit Detroit. And this is a story, this is a poem about his visiting. It's called Personal Political Poem. Around midnight, I stalled outside a police station in Henry Ford's hometown. The cops told me to keep walking. A mile later, the Arab gas station attendant, the name embroidered on his shirt said Sam. He talked and talked and talked. He asked if I recognized him. He said when we were young, we knew each other. He'd been to the house I grew up in. His father loved my father. His mother loved my mother. He said he was sorry for what happened. He said, we're all dying, but we should get to grow old. And just like that shouldn't be how a life ends. He said he was at the funeral. Seeing me carry the casket made him imagine one day doing the same. I said it was late. I needed to get back. The cops were going to tow my car. He showed me a newspaper. He said he was the guy who pulled a drowning girl from a crowded pool. He pointed to the mayor, shaking his hand. He said he went to high school with the mayor, who was the kind of guy who would jab his finger at your chest and say, you don't look like a Sam. There was something better out there, he said. He knew there was, for him, for me. I told him it was true. He did not look like a Sam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, Anne, his pose. <laughs> or a summer, or you know, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, this is Hayan's poetry. Really, it's it's very moving. It takes you to a place that's so immediate and visceral, but also there's so much humor in it. Yeah. And a lot of his current poetry is about living in Texas, and it's just it's really I I really enjoy it. Uh, the next contributor is another former student. Um, uh, someone who was on, on the, when I first started teaching on the Dearborn campus, she was a student and she was part of a group of young Arabs who, who were part of our Arab Student Union and were very supportive of, uh, of our trying to get a center started. And, you know, she's a young woman who struggled quite a bit in life because she had a difficult childhood and she writes about that difficult childhood. So um, I'm just going to read a brief um, excerpt from her work, which is also very brave. She deals with the the, um, the abusive household that she grew up in. And it, despite the, the, the difficulty of the chapter, you'll see there's also a lot of humor in it. She's just, her brain is firing on a hundred levels. Most days I do not want to get out of bed, brush my hair, shower, but I do. I go through the motions, call off work, clear my schedule, get the kids to school, and then crawl back into bed until it is time to go pick them up. I tell this to the doctor. I feel like a wounded animal backed into a corner. Uh, do I tell the doctor about the emotional eating that has turned into binge eating? Do I tell her that the last family function triggered a violent and horrible memory that has sent me into a tailspin? Do I tell her that this downward spiral has no end in sight and that I have not yet reached rock bottom? Do I tell her that I send my kids in the house after we get home and that I sit in my driveway and scream and sob and yell myself into exhaustion? What do I tell this doctor who is trying to understand why I am ruining myself? You have put on more weight since the last time you were here. What is going on? 
you have a vitamin deficiency, you are dangerously close to having full-blown diabetes, you are malnourished, your liver's in trouble, you have high cholesterol, and I suspect sleep apnea. Tell me, Terry, what is going on? So I tell her, I tell her, and I tell her, and I tell her, breaking down in her office, and I tell her. Doc pulls up her chair to me. She offers me a box of Kleenex. I take the box, vigorously pulling out 10 pieces of tissue. I dab my eyes, and I keep talking. She listens. Her eyes never move from my face. She is taking this all in, and I am filled with sorrow for what I am inflicting upon her. She is tall and blonde and beautiful. She is a good doctor, an even better human being. She is goodness and wholesome, heavily pregnant, from Canada. I wonder if I'm hurting her baby. I cannot be censored any longer. I know that there are consequences for telling my story. I am thankful that I am in the privacy of this doctor's office, that I do not have an audience. But these things happen to little girls with neglectful mothers. I wonder if things like this happen in Canada. I don't know why I think this, but I do. This happens everywhere. She tells me to take a deep breath and start from the beginning, and I do. Doc, I was five. Um, the next contributor is uh, also a, a young woman who grew up in Dearborn, also the, the daughter of immigrant parents, a much happier household. <laughs> Um, uh, and she's a poet, and right now she's teaching, teaching in New York at NYU. Uh, she has two pieces in the, in the collection, and they both really uh, talk about what Dearborn means to her, what Dearborn meant to her growing up. Yeah, and I'll, yeah, and I'll just say, I guess we're not... We're not uh, Do um, I have time to read? I, I'm not sure, but what I would like to say is like, what's so interesting about her work, especially the ones included in this book, is that they really transcend genre. So it's, it's a mix of... It reads like a prose poem, but it's also a work of nonfiction. So it kind of, you know, uh, borrows from different genres, which is really interesting. And she just does it effortlessly. Yeah, and and she also brings out the universal in the in yeah. the in the story of her yeah, childhood. It's really nice. So okay, so then um, the next contributor is is Nabil Abraham. He's one of our co-editors. He was born in Detroit, grew up in De well, he was born in North Carolina, but he grew up in Detroit, and uh, and he taught many years in Dearborn, lived in Dearborn for many years, and um, you know he he is the oldest person in the collection, and uh, he grew up at a at a different time. You know he went to college in the 60s and the 70s, and um, you know got his graduate degree here from the University of Michigan. And, uh, you know, he was from a Palestinian immigrant family, and his family was very political. He, he also grew up in the, um, the, that, that first mosque that, that was founded in Dearborn, and, um, you know, has, has, so he had a political education, basically, from his family, and by growing up in the period that he grew up in, and definitely considers himself to be a supporter of the Palestinian resistance, and, um, and, in America, <laughs> which if, you know, I think we, we have a much better understanding of the Palestinian conflict in society today than we did back in the period that he was growing up. Um, it was very hard for him to get a platform to speak. And, um, and so th that's what he writes about. He writes about what it was like to be a political activist back in the 70s and the early 80s and how often um, in trying to communicate his family's experiences of displacement and occupation um, and exile, um, you know, he was silenced or found himself shouting kind of against the machine. And it's, it's so this is an essay about him sort of like reflecting back on what that what that was. And again, it's a it's a, a wonderful essay, but it's it's hard for us to find like well, just one paragraph. Right. Um, all right, and so we're at the end. Um, the last essay was was written by me, and although I'm not an Arab American, I've been involved in the community for many many years. And so I'm just going to read one paragraph, um, which maybe sums up um, some of how I feel about the place. <laughs> After I, I mean, I came to Dearborn in 1987, so I've been working there in one capacity or another for a long time now. Um, in 2018, I attended the 100th anniversary of the Salina School, the South End neighborhood's most vital and enduring institution. It was packed to the gills with people, standing room only for every single part of the festivities. It was amazing to see the history of the neighborhood represented in the flesh, as it were. 
the older, very gray-haired crowd, a mix of Poles, Romanians, Italians, Maltese, Lebanese, and the occasional Southerner, were seated together, often with walkers and wheelchairs at the ready. Slightly younger people in their 60s were more likely to be Arab, don't worry about it, uh, mostly Lebanese, but with plenty of Palestinian and Yemeni couples as well. Those in their 40s and younger were increasingly Yemeni, as were all of the children on hand. Today, the neighborhood is overwhelmingly Yemeni, with a spattering of Sudanese, Somali, and other black Muslims. And despite this obvious transition from one so social group to another over time, from a highly diverse group of working class immigrant whites to still arriving Yemeni Americans, the crowd was loving and affectionate. People expressed over and again how their experiences of growing up in this marginal space, this isolated, low-income, and environmentally hazardous place, had been a delight. Whichever generation they were a part of, they had in common immigrant parents, the isolated, tough, but tightly-knit community of the South End, along with that lack of pretension and openness that, go, that gives the place its personality. And they had stories to share, so many stories. Yeah, thanks for reading that. Right. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank thanks you for, for joining here. us tonight. Thank you for coming. Yeah. And do you have questions for us? You were here longer than you have No, I, I asked my question before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I came because um, I'm also an immigrant from, but from, uh, from Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. But my family, my father's side, which is the dominant side, yeah. regardless. I'm going to pause and interrupt you for a second and actually sure. ask, you, ask your question in the mic just because we are sure. streaming, so for okay. an audience and then also for future reports. So, and, and I, you know, I came here in 77, and so the, the, the idea of, you know, the, the, the seeking, uh, uh, the, the immigrant experience is very authentic and clear mm -hmm. to me, and I, I am a, also a therapist, and, and I, that is what I, I focus a lot on. People who grew up like me with, uh, you know, I too came from a household where I'm the first girl in my whole family on my father's side that was allowed to go to school mm -hmm. beyond, you know, sixth grade because mm -hmm. everybody was married off, uh, arranged marriages, but they take them out of school. And so, but I grew up with cousins who although we're from Eritrea, we grew up in Ethiopia, but they were the only peers, relatives that I had. But I saw them, and my, my uncle had two wives, and I saw Asiya and Zakia, my cousins, being, we grew up as, in a certain similar way, and then we cleaved because mm -hmm. they were taken out of school and kept home mm -hmm. in preparation to get married off by age 16. And, um, and also growing up in a household where, you know, abuse of every every kind you know mm -hmm. so I was supposed to be, go to school if I didn't succeed for any reason I went to German school which is really good school and all schools are really good back home um, but the, the always the specter was if I did anything wrong it didn't matter what I what I did my father's threat would be I'm going to take you out of school and send you to my to your uncle's house and get marry you so it was a constant mm -hmm. specter and I, so I worked with a lot of folks who also then live here, like myself, and then all the different transitions we went through to just, you know, assimilate and acclimate to the degree, I don't like the word assimilation, but you have to, to in order to survive, you know. Mm -hmm. But still these things go on, so I work with, with people who, m most of my re referrals come from U of M, um, <clears throat> so people who are in PhD programs, but still the, the issue of, having to deal with culture and home life versus themselves as Arab American or, uh, you know, Eritrean American, or, you know, whatever, every, every hyphenation of American you can imagine. It's, it's, a, it's a through line that is a common denominator regardless of where people are from. And it's, it's uh, fascinating, fascinating. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, and the thing that, I mean, when, when we were assembling these essays, we tried to find as diverse a, you know, the, we, we didn't have any limitations on who could be included mm -hmm. as long as they were from the community. And, um, and, you know, so we didn't have any expectation going into it. And we got a lot of the, the, 
you know, when we were writing the introduction, we were sort of reading over and over and over again, and like, what do these, what do these essays have in common? And I think um, the immigrant parents are stand out. You know, so many, either you have an immigrant parent mm -hmm. in this narrative or you have an immigrant grandparent. Um, but, the, but the experience of those parents, you know, where those parents came from, the amount of trauma those parents had been through, um, and then the, the expectations that the parents had. So Yusuf's father was religious. He, his, his, his name, uh, he's, he, I mean, I think the family expected him to be a Quran reciter, you know, and instead he, he does, you know, hip hop, you know. Um, so, the, you know, there's always expectation that the parent generation has on the child. And, and so a lot of these young people are defying their parents. And we see as in Terry's essay, you know, really, you know, defying her whole community's expectation because she's now sharing this story publicly. Um, but the, 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 the thing that strikes me even more than that is how so many of these people, they're, they're not just the children of immigrants, they're the children of refugees. Yep. Mm -hmm. And there is such a difference between coming here as a voluntary immigrant, you know, often for economic opportunities, having made the decision yourself to come, having saved money, having gotten the training maybe you need, you know, all those steps you go, having connections in the new world, a cousin who's going to sponsor you or something, and coming here as a refugee, you know, where you're ripped out of your home in the middle of the night, and, you know, you, you suffer often many, many years before you can get to America, especially if you're a refugee from the Arab world, because because of our government, <laughs> our suspicion of Arabs and Muslims. But you get here and it's such a relief. And I, I find that the young people whose parents are refugees, they, they have a, like, it's like Hanan's essay, mm -hmm. you know, that they have a little bit more tenderness for their parents, you know, even if they disagree with the parents. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that this is also true of Yasmin. Her parents weren't refugees, but she gets where they're coming from. You know, she wanted something different for herself and she got it, mm -hmm. you know. And her parents now are very proud of her, you know, but but um, but I don't know. But, it, but that that respect for the parent generation, that love and that appreciation for what they did, I find it's a kind of maturity in these essays that is that to honestly, I read a lot of immigrant literature. <laughs> I, I find that there's a maturity in these voices that that that, that I noticed when we were working on it. And, and loyalty. I mean, loyalty. To, to that's a great word. Is huge. Loyalty. And, and we, you know, we came also because of the revolution in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. Like the military took over, and you know, you got out. My parents were business people. Everything was being nationalized. Mm -hmm. And then we also saw them come here, and I had never seen my father, like, hold a broom and clean anything. But they opened up a, a business here, and there he was cleaning the bathroom. Mm -hmm. This man, never, you know, he was a well-known musician, composer back home. I never thought he would do anything like that. But mm -hmm. here, one, so so even though I'd be furious at him because he, you know, he had all these rules about <clears throat> me going out with my friends, you know, and, and I'd gotten into senior year in high school and my friends wanted to go out. The first day I remember I came back from, from school and my friends were all planning on going out. So I just like, went in and decided, well, we're in America now, so I can do that, even though I could never do it back home. So, and so I got ready, my friends were coming to pick me up, and my father's like, you're, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to go out with my friends. And, and so it was, that was a whole scene. But what, so even though I had these real anger issues and couldn't wait to leave, and I ended up leaving two years after we moved, I decided, okay, I'm going to just, I, I have to get out because I can't live by those rules. But to, and my dad's gone now, uh, but the loyalty that you have also is you, you see what, how your parents have to basically do anything and everything they can to, mm -hmm. to keep the family together and to support the family and, and giving up whatever pride they had to, to to become, you know, a viable parent supporting a family of, you know, five, six kids, you know, and, and, and you respect, regardless of how angry you are at them, you respect what they have gone through on the other end, mm -hmm. trying to get us out of the country, and then once here, trying to make a living, you know, and start from scratch. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I find that, you know, I live here in Ann Arbor, 
and whenever I go to the airport, I take a lift or something like that. My drivers are overwhelmingly mm -hmm. immigrants, usually yeah. from the Middle East, not always. There are a lot of African drivers here, too. But, but um, yeah, I always, you know, they're all, <laughs> either they're immigrants or the children of immigrants. And they like it because I talk to them about who they were, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, before they came. Because they were often, you know, very middle class, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, but they're doing this now and doing everything that they can to get their kids educated yeah. so that their and kids have a have a middle class future here. Is yeah. not above and beyond yeah. anything. Yeah. Yeah. And there, I think there's also, you know, to speak to the conservativeness of your parents, I mean, they were bringing with them their cultural norms from home. But there's also, for a lot of immigrants, there is a, um, a sense, there's a fear of America, right? The America you see on TV with mm -hmm. sexual mores that maybe mm -hmm. many immigrant mm -hmm. families don't recognize, among other things. Uh, and the parents want to protect their children from that. They want their children to be culturally like them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and one thing that is also sort of different about this volume than some of the earlier work we did on Detroit is that now, you know, there was immigration in the early part of the 20th century, but it was very difficult for Middle Easterners to come here because of our Asian exclusion yeah. laws until the 1960s. Yeah. But since the 1960s, there's just been one group after another that has come. The Lebanese came, the Palestinians came. Now we have Iraqis and Yemenis coming and Syrians, and people are still coming from mm -hmm. all those countries. And the, the thing that makes Dearborn really distinctive, and this is true of the whole metro area, is that now you come and you're not just if you especially if you come to Dearborn you're not arriving in you know in America in you know you're you're not a, arriving in an America that's not Arab you're arriving in an Arab American community yep. mm -hmm. and so you see all these they're Arabs just in the country yeah you yeah. see all these Arabs who you know who were born here or second third generation American people like Jeff Karoub who are completely comfortable mm -hmm. but they're still choosing to live in Dearborn mm -hmm. you know and so I think I think that for some of the more recently arrived people, they're like, okay, look, there's a Yemeni community here. I don't have to be afraid. You know, my right. kids can be a part of this Yemeni mm -hmm. community and they can still be American. You know, so I think that some of that, that harshness or that, that, that the fear that the immigrant parent had, I think that Dearborn is alleviating some of that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I will say that some of my Iraqi students who are from sort of conservative Shia families, they say, I'm like, well, your parents must be a little bit relaxed because they're in this big Muslim community with all these mosques everywhere. And they say, no, but they look at the Lebanese and they say, look, they're not, they're not really Muslims at all. <laughs> it makes them even more, yeah. more conservative, you know. So yeah. there, is, there is still that judgment, you know. Yeah. And it's, it, 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 it's, it just speaks to the real challenge that, that immigration yeah. faces. And the other thing I want to point out, too, is like, one of the things, you know, that we also, in general, don't know, you know, unless you're exposed to it, is the the kind of pressure the parents also have when they decide to take their children out of the country. I remember my father mm -hmm. saying, like his 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 everybody in his family was saying to him, "You're going to lose control of your children when you go to America." So that was a huge, sure. huge fear he had. And, and perhaps the fear that there's no promise of return either. Yeah, yeah, that you for know. sure. Yeah. And, but but I remember that was mm -hmm. a thing that he he had to fight with himself to to yeah. bring us here. And my stepmother is American. That's how we ended up in rural farm town, Ohio. Is mm -hmm. is, is where we ended up settling, which was a whole different experience. Challenging. And, yeah. but, but it was, we were thrilled. I mean, we were so happy yeah. That, yeah. that we were. Well, tell him about your family. He's got, his family has an interesting story. Um, yeah, I touched on it a bit in, 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 in the book, or in, in, in my essay in the book, in the sense that um, my great-grandfather, he was part of the first wave of Arab immigration mm -hmm. um, to the United States. He came in the 1920s. He actually, um, he went to Brazil first. He didn't really like it there, uh, and, and he just moved up. And he went through Ellis Island, got his name changed, mm -hmm. and um, he went to West Virginia. Um, long story short, he actually loved being in the States, mm -hmm. but, and, um, but eventually he went back to Lebanon to marry, uh, and then he brought, her, he brought his young wife back to West Virginia. But um, when, he gave, uh, when, when, um, when they started having kids, uh, they had um, two girls, one of whom is my grandmother, uh, they were actually really terrified of raising them in the United States. So my great-grandfather sent my great-grandmother and their two 
<laughs> daughters back to Lebanon. Yeah. And so my grandmother was actually born in West Virginia, but she grew up in Lebanon. And since then, our family has kind of been going back mm. and forth between Lebanon and America. It's not like, it's, it's interesting, I was telling someone about this just um, earlier today in a, in a meeting that, um, you know, just leaving um, um, a place to come to, 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 immigrating to America, doesn't mean you just kind of sever all your ties to your homeland. And in our case, we've just kind of been going back and forth. So I was born in Washington, D.C., but I grew up in the Arab world. Um, so, yeah. And, and also, the, the, uh, it can also be a, the best thing that happens oh, to the sure. kid. Like for me, we were in rural Ohio. My stepmother's family are all farmers, went to high school where only 99 kids uh, graduating class. That's why I was a senior. And I was very angry child growing up back home <laughs> because of all the rules and couldn't do anything, you know, um, because I'm a Muslim girl and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was so happy because the family that my stepmother brought us and then she went back, my father and she came a year later. So we lived with her cousins um, they, in, in, in Norwalk, Ohio. And I remember Frank, the, you know, her cousin who's like our dad now, sa saying to me, and my name is Yasmin also, so he's like, of course, Jasmine is how he said, mm -hmm. Jasmine, now that you're a senior, you can stay out till midnight. <laughs> and to me, that was just like the sky opened up mm -hmm. because I could never go anywhere before. So, so it was also interesting how, how the, my whole personality changed when mm -hmm. we came here. Mm -hmm. And so, and I did incredibly well in high school in rural Ohio because it was so easy for me. And so I was a class clown, which I had, none of my friends back home would have called me a class clown. And most likely to succeed and best character because I was so happy. It was like <laughs> the happiest year of my life. So it's, it's funny. There are difficult aspects of it and, and the struggle sure. that you have when, within the home life, but then socially, yeah. it, it was a night and day experience yeah. and a, a joy for mm -hmm. also. Interesting. Well, thank you for sharing thank your you sharing. experience. Yeah, it's so compelling. And we want to thank you, Steve, and thank the library again yeah. for hosting us, and thank the Library of Michigan, mm -hmm. and thank you, I can't remember your name, Chet, Chet, Chet. For, mm -hmm. for joining us as well, and you, Yasmin, yeah. and everybody at your home who's watching and has stayed on till the end. <laughs> Um, yeah, and we encourage you to buy the book. I mean, it's yeah. it's really beautiful. The, the, a lot of the essays are just really beautiful, and, and you'll learn something about the Arab community or about the immigrant experience mm -hmm. yeah. that, that you, you, I guarantee, didn't know before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you.